hey YouTube, guess what? We got three days till Thanksgiving. Uh, I already started cooking, of course, because I'm a little bit crazy that way. And uh, this is one of my favorite days of the year. I look forward to this for 364 days and I can't wait. So uh, I've already gotten started on Thanksgiving. Um, got my turkey and all my shopping done already. Uh, started my cranberry sauce this morning and I shot that video so I'll show you with you how I did it. Uh, but I've had some questions come in y'all and I'm here to answer them for you the best I can. And I want to tell you uh, thank you very much actually for watching and for shooting me those questions. It lets me know what you all want to know and so that makes my channel better. All right, so the first thing, I had some comments that came in from last week on some stuff that uh, people expanded on some of the stuff that I had posted last week, and I thought it was some really good information. And I wanted to uh, share with you what uh, some of the viewers said. Let's see. Let me get the first one up. I did a video last week on how to roast sweet potatoes, and I talked about how you can wrap it uh, in uh, plastic wrap. You can wrap a sweet potato in plastic wrap, you can throw it in the microwave, and that's fine. But then when you roast them and you let them have all that time in the oven, the, the, the sugars all caramelize, and it's like candy. Well, Paul F. mentioned that his mom had always microwaved uh, sweet potatoes, and that he found kind of a halfway point. He would do uh, the microwave on, on high, I think, for eight to nine minutes, do the plastic wrap. But then the oven can take over, and he does... 30 minutes at 400 degrees. So it really shortens the cooking time and you still get all those caramelized sugars. So I thought that was an awesome idea. I thought that was great. Um, might be jumping on and, and stealing that one this year. Because uh, I think anything that, that delivers the same impact and the same flavor uh, and shortens the time, that's a win-win in my book. I think that's, that's awesome. And then we talked about, I think last week we were talking about uh, dressing versus stuffing and where we get the disconnect and, and how to make sure that your, your stuffing inside the bird is safe so that it comes up to temperature at the right time. Um, so somebody else will say, let me make sure I give credit because I thought this was also a great idea. Um, Gil, G-I-L, Gil 20, yes, Gil 2727. I thought this was a great idea, and I thought this was another one of those things that can deliver the same kind of impact and the same kind of flavor um, that you would do an old-fashioned way, but this one's a little safer, a little more streamlined. And what Gil mentioned, I hope I'm saying that right, and if I don't, I'm apologizing right now. <laughs> um, what he mentioned was to, to put the, sl the stuffing in the slow cooker, um, and they mentioned that the, the slow cooker with the lid on mimics the cavity of the bird, and that's actually, that's exactly what's going to happen. Uh, you have that nice moist environment, and that as it cooks, the bits that are on the edges of the slow cooker get nice and brown, and that you can stir those in, and that instead of taking your pan drippings and basting your bird with it, which really doesn't do anything for your bird except make the skin soggy, take some of those pan drippings, and as the slow cooker is working with the dressing, or stuffing. Uh, as that's working, you get the juices from the turkey to cook with your dressing. That way, your dressing comes up to the correct temperature and you've got all the safety issues addressed, but you still have the same kind of fabulous oomph and, and impact of flavor. So I wanted to share that one with you too because I thought that was, that was a genius idea. I thought that was a wonderful way to do it. So that addresses the safety issue of getting your stuffing with the eggs up to temperature um, and, the, and the dressing issue of, of baking it in a separate dish. And then I got a big, long conversation <laughs> with, with Troy uh, T from T-Roy Cooks. We had a conversation about the stuffing versus dressing thing and where it came from. Uh, and this is something that uh, I've been tickled about for several years. So traditionally, stuffing is from north of the Mason-Dixon line. People up there um, would stuff their birds with you know whatever combination they like to use, and of course it varies so much. You know, not just from region to region, but even from you know different parts of a, a particular state will do it differently. So use whatever is the tradition in your family. Use what you like. But the the stuffing thing where the 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 dressing stuff, the stuffing, <laughs> was cooked inside the bird. That was traditionally from north of the Mason-Dixon line. And then dressing is what we did here in the south, where we would do the same type of recipe or the same type of dish, but we would bake it alongside the bird in its own casserole dish or in a separate container. 
And it wasn't until a few years ago that I actually had stuffing baked in the bird for the first time. And I tell you, I was absolutely hooked. But there is a problem of making sure that stuffing gets up to the correct temperature so that it's safe to eat because it cooks more slowly than the bird, but it needs a higher temperature to be safe. So, um, yes, Teresa, I agree. <laughs> uh, it can be dangerous because you've got to get those eggs and the raw juices that come out of the bird when it's cooking. You've got to get that up to 185, but you need to pull your bird when the thigh meat hits 165. So we talked last week. We can go it's recorded. It's back there. We talked last week about how to do that. So I was telling T. Roy that I thought that the difference, why the South and why the North had done it differently, um, was because of refrigeration and safety, and that we just didn't do that um, because it was hotter. So I have no idea where I got this information. I'm sure I read it somewhere because it dawned on me at the same time that we've got no problem putting oysters in our everything that we make. So I'm not sure what the refrigeration dressing stuffing divide is. But traditionally, that's what it was. Stuffing was from up north. Dressing was from down south. And I think uh, Gil's solution of doing it in the slow cooker to, to have the safety part, uh, but to get the same flavors, I thought that was just genius, and I'm probably going to do that this year. So hats off to whoever came up with that, and you, that just shows you can't always count on everything I say <laughs> as being gospel. I don't know where I got that. I'm sure I read it somewhere. <laughs> okay, let's see. We had a couple other things I wanted to talk about. We had questions. We've been talking a lot about cast iron. Um, we all love our cast iron. I don't think it can be beat. And I had a question about how to clean it. And I'll tell you what I did. My grandmother always said, you never let soap touch your cast iron. Um, <laughs> Teresa, I use mine all the time, but I don't think I ever pull them out on Thanksgiving. This is going to be a first for me. Um, my grandmother said, never let soap touch your cast iron. And actually, that's true. But then you, you get people that freak out over how do you clean it. Uh, so the trick to cast iron is... You want to get it seasoned to where you have that nice, shiny surface so that it essentially is, is non-stick cookware, right? And soap or scouring or scrubbing can break that seasoning. And once it's broken, you have to completely re-season in order to get it back where you want it. And the longer a cast iron skillet can stay seasoned correctly, the better. The more and more non-stick it will be and the more useful you'll find it. Um, to clean it, however, uh, I often fry in cast iron and you end up with a big mess. So what I do is I do give it a little bit of soap. Not much, but enough to just break the grease. I then give it a good scrub with just plain salt. And after I get it you know, nice and clean with a little bit of soap and a little bit of salt, um, I do give it a quick wipe with olive oil before I put it back or hang it up on the racks. That way the seasoning is protected. You get it nice and clean. You know it's been, uh, you know, i got weird bacteria lingering anywhere in, in the crevices. But uh, that's how I clean it. Um, been doing that for, I'm not going to tell y'all how old I am, but I've been doing that for, since I was very, very young. I'd say 35, 40 years I've been cleaning cast iron that way. And I've never had a problem with mine. I love it. So that is how to maintain and clean your cast iron. Let's see, one of the other questions. Okay, so we talked about. The dressing and the stuffing, we talked about the roasted sweet potato. Oh, I have been getting more and more questions about how I shop, which kind of tickled me to death because um, I have a huge family. Um, takes quite a bit to, to keep and maintain a pantry here because I do maintain a pantry. I have uh, quite a bit of staples all the time. And I was kind of laughing over the way I shop because I, can, I don't do it the way most people do. Uh, the first thing I do is we've got a major warehouse club. It's about an hour away. Um, I do have a couple of grocery stores in town, uh, and actually they've been getting better and better. We have a couple now that I'd say would rival many of the bigger cities. Um, that wasn't always the case. But because the volume of food that, that comes in and, and needs to be worked with in my house, I look for anything I can to shortcut the actual shopping process. Um, and because we don't use a whole lot of processed foods, I mean, very, very few, I found that couponing is just not for us. You know, it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort, and most of the products that I have found, um, it's just not the stuff that, that my family eats. So what I do is I've got an app downloaded on my iPhone, and 
as we run out of things, I pull that app up and I do a quick check. So like I think uh, this morning I put Coco on the list. Um, you can add stuff to your shopping cart, you know, right from your phone. Uh, so I pulled up Coco and I did a, qu a quick check against the online prices for the grocery stores in my area. And I also do a quick check against Amazon to see which place is going to give me the best price per ounce or per per pound or per, per whatever unit it is. Uh, I have most of the time the warehouse place has the best price. So I'll go ahead and add it to my shopping cart. Now I've got a shopping uh, cart started on my phone and you know, the app on the phone that I think uh, day before yesterday I, I put something in. I don't remember what because I don't have to remember it. As I notice that, that I run out of things or as I think, oh yeah, you know, I'm going to need this. I go ahead and add it right then and there while I'm thinking about it. Um, I also have an Amazon app. I can do the same thing. So if the warehouse club doesn't carry something, um, baking chocolate, I think, is something I looked up yesterday. Uh, they don't have it at the warehouse place. So I went online. I looked at Amazon. They do have baking chocolate, but I noticed it's very expensive to buy it that way. So I immediately stuck it on a note uh, in my phone. So that's my shopping list. But once I have gotten my shopping cart, the warehouse app, warehouse club app, shopping cart, once I've gotten to the point where there's some critical item at the house that, that we're going to need, um, milk, is, is a big one. I've got, I get usually six to eight gallons at a time, but when we get down to the last gallon and a half of milk, I'll go ahead and, and hit check out. Now what that does is it sends it up to the warehouse club, and I do this, I try to coordinate around the day when we go up there anyway. We do some shopping up there. We have doctor's appointments, um, but I'll hit submit, and then all I have to do is go to the club. It's ready to go. I pick it up, um, I don't have to mess with it. <laughs> and what also happens is I don't end up wandering around going, oh, you know what? I need this and I need this. Um, and I've gotten our food budget down pretty tight. Uh, this time I decided I'm going to figure out exactly what I spend and I'm going to try to calculate the difference in what I spend just to feed the family and what I spend doing the uh, YouTube videos and what I spend doing the TV shows because there's a little bit of a break out there. We end up eating all of it. Uh, but there are things that I normally, you know, I probably would not purchase if I weren't doing one of the shows. Um, YouTube videos, that's the way we eat. That's how we do it anyway. So that's not, that's not that much difference. But I'm going to track it. And so on December 19th, I'm going to try to figure out exactly what I've spent for a family right now of 11 uh, to feed us for a month. And I've got the first video on, on how I did that. I've almost got that edited out and ready to go. So somebody was asking me how, how much I bring in for Thanksgiving. Um, it's a lot, uh, but it's not as much as I guess you would think because of how I maintain my pantry to begin with. I had quite a bit of the items that I would use already here and already ready to go. So there's that. That's my, my Thanksgiving shopping haul, which is really not much of a haul. It's more pull up and have some guy load my car. <laughs> I need all the help I can get. <laughs> uh, somebody had asked me about the broth after Thanksgiving and how do you deal with the turkey leftovers. So the best thing I think to do is to pick your bird clean, go ahead and, and pull all the meat off of it. And I do have videos up on how to carve a turkey um, and that'll show you how to do a lot of that. And then yeah, I get in there and I get every last scrap out that I can. And then yes, everything else that, that is there, the carcass, the bones, um, if I didn't use all the pan drippings, which I don't know why I wouldn't, but if I didn't use all the pan drippings, all that goes into the pot. You just cover it with water um, just a little bit. You want to get as little water as possible because that's going to give you the best concentration of flavor. So cover it just barely. Bring it up to a boil. Reduce it to a simmer. Give it a good hour, hour and a half. Um, some, I think I had one. I had a leftover bird from one of the TV shows day before yesterday. I let that one go for four hours. Um, strain it. Uh, sometimes I put it through cheesecloth. Most of the time I just don't bother. I just run it through a strainer and then you can chill it. The fat will come to the top. You can pop that fat cap off and then you've got broth to use, you know, however, however you want to use it. You need soups and stews or make pan sauces. Uh, you can throw it in the freezer if you want to. It lasts beautifully. Uh, never lasts long in my house because I do go through a lot of broth. Um, even matter of fact, even right now, I even went ahead and bought some commercial broth just to make sure I have enough on hand because this time of year, it seems like everybody's always wanting something involving broth, so I want to make sure I have enough. So that's how to do the turkey carcass. 
forgot what I was talking about. That's how you do the turkey carcass after Thanksgiving. Yes, I think I've often said that nothing goes to waste in my house. I save everything. Um, and that's one of the, a matter of fact, that fat cap that rises to the top, save that and saute your potatoes in it. You'll love it. It's wonderful. So nothing goes to waste in my house. Yes, I serve, I save it all. Okay, then we had some people that had sent me a couple questions where they'd gotten the, the book, um, My Happier Holidays Cookbook, and I talk about planning and, and how do you really make sure that, that Thanksgiving goes smoothly. And so here's, here's a couple things I want to say. First of all, um, don't panic. <laughs> I think the number one mistake people make at Thanksgiving is freaking out over everything having to be perfect. And actually think about it. If, if you look back at your fondest holiday memories, I guarantee some of the best are going to be around a screw up of some kind. Okay. So the first thing I want to say is relax. It, it is Thanksgiving and yes, it's wonderful and I love it. Not everything has to be perfect. Uh, the second thing is, I think a lot of people make a mistake of, of kind of not having a game plan ahead of time. They know what they want to make, but they don't sit down and think out, this dish takes this amount of time, this dish needs to be on the stovetop, this has to be in the oven, because if you've only got one oven, like I do right now, I've only got one oven, uh, you've got a turkey that's going to be in there. So you need to re, you know, think out how are you going to get your side dishes. Like if you're doing a green bean casserole, if you're doing a sweet potato casserole, how are you going to make sure those are hot and ready to go? So sit down and, and take a few minutes. It takes very little time. Put some pen to paper and, and make a plan over what dishes you have, what dishes you might need to borrow. Do you have enough bowls? Do you have enough serving pieces? That kind of thing. And what needs to be in the oven? You might find uh, that it might make sense to... Do your turkey on the grill so that you've got your oven space for all your other dishes. Um, you might want to invest and in, in do a deep fryer thing. Um, but that's the kind of, that's probably, I would say, the number one mistake people run into is just not taking that few minutes to do a plan. Uh, the second thing is, I think people underestimate how long it takes to defrost your turkey. You need four days. So your turkey should be in the refrigerator now. If you, if you bought it and it was frozen, it needs to be in the refrigerator now. Uh, if you absolutely run into an emergency, I did do a video, I think last year, on the fastest way to defrost a turkey. You can do it in a few hours if you have to. It's not necessarily the best or you know the safest. The safest is to do it slowly in the refrigerator. But there is a way, it's, they call it the bucket method or the water method. So it's the quickest way to defrost a turkey. You can do that, but it's much better if you go ahead and stick them in the refrigerator today and let it come comes down or come up in temperature and defrost slowly, uh, that's going to give you the best result. Uh, number three mistake, I think, people undercook their bird. <clears throat> a, a meat thermometer, and you can go to, to the big box store. You can go to the big box store and buy one for less than $20 or go online, there, you know, go on Amazon and, and buy one. It's still less than $20. And a good meat thermometer um, will save you tons and tons of worry and headache and money by making sure that the whatever you have invested your money in is cooked correctly and it's delicious and it's how you want it. Um, so grab a meat thermometer. You need to get your turkey to 165 degrees at the thickest part of the thigh. I don't know why I'm touching my thigh like you can see it or that makes a difference. <laughs> you want it the thickest part of the thigh, 165 degrees. Um, and a meat thermometer will let you know exactly when that is. Don't rely on the pop-up that come in a lot of commercial turkeys. Don't rely on that pop-up button. It, it'll be overcooked by the time that thing goes off. Uh, the second is people overcook their birds. They get worried that it's not going to be cooked well, and so they keep going. Um, pretty much, I think, is a safety issue. They get concerned over that, and you end up with a tough, stringy bird. Um, I think one of the best ways to kind of, of ensure that if you're going for 165, even to 170, if you have to, uh, one of the best ways to ensure you're not overdoing the breast meat is to lay a strip of tin foil over the breast of the bird, and that'll help keep it um, moist and while the dark meat comes to the higher temperature that it needs to get cooked through. Uh, I think that's about it. Um, yeah, Teresa, she, Teresa's mentioning um, on cast iron that she uses only hot water 
while the skillet is still warm. Um, and chain mill, I'm not sure what chain mill is. You mean one of those scrubbies? Is that what you're talking about? Um, now, my grandmother would have at you if you used one of those <laughs> skillet. If I'm thinking about the same thing, she's absolutely not. Uh, we use just a, a bristle brush, when, and I do a little, little uh, salt and water and scrub it out, and that tends to uh, just a drop or two of soap uh, with the salt and the water, and that tends to get rid of uh, the grease and the stuck on stuff, and then I give it a good wipe before with oil before I put it up. Um, so if that's what you mean, um, I don't know, let me know what you meant. I'm not sure what a chain metal is. I, now I kind of want to know. Um, I think... That was all the questions I had. I'm looking through real quick uh, to make sure I got everybody. Uh, like I said, you know, Thanksgiving is supposed to be fun. And I, I think that's the one thing people get stressed out, that something's not going to happen right. Um, if you've got guests coming over, tell them they can bring stuff. You know, relax and, and, and enjoy your company and enjoy the meal that, that you're making. Um, da, 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 da. Oh. One last question I did have. Um, typically, when I do my bird, I brine my bird. And this year, I bought a natural fresh turkey. I had Joey and my seven-year-old at the store with me, and he saw this giant, giant bird. And it was a, a natural, and it was a fresh turkey. So I did buy a tw it's 23 pounds. I bought a 23-pound bird. Normally, I do two smaller birds because they tend to be more tender. But he got so excited over the giant turkey, I had to. Um, so... One of the tricks that, that I think helps really ensure that the bird is perfectly crispy brown on the outside and juicy and tender inside is to put it in the oven, and I use a high heat to begin. So I'll start cooking at 500 degrees, and I'll give it a good you know 30 minutes at 500. I'll give it about 10 minutes off the top just in the oven, and then I take a big sheet of foil and very loosely tint the bird after that. That way, the, the skin gets crisp and seals the bird. Um, the inside, the meat stays tender, it stays juicy, and because I've brined it, it, it tastes great, but the skin doesn't get too dark too soon. And I'll take that foil, I'll take that, that tint off the bird for the last hour of cooking and just kind of keep an eye on it. Although for the most part, once I get past that half hour at 500, I turn it down to 350, it gets about two and a half to three hours, this big bird will take a little bit longer. For the most part, I don't open the oven door. I just leave it alone. Because remember, I've got a meat thermometer sitting there. I know what the internal temperature is, and I can gauge how fast the rest of the meal is going based on that. So use your aluminum foil. It, it will help a lot with that kind of thing. Okay, guys, uh, any additional questions, shoot them to me. I'm doing a couple live shows between now and Thursday. I'll be at uh, WJHL in Johnson City for Daytime Tri-Cities on Wednesday. We're going to be talking about Thanksgiving emergencies. Um, and then I've got the uh, rest of the week. I'm going to be right here with you on YouTube. So if you've got questions, shoot it to me, and I will do my best to get your questions answered as fast as I can. So, oh, hi, Ethan. <laughs> Hi, thanks for joining us. Uh, but anyway, shoot those questions to me. I'll help you out. And in between, relax, make a plan, work your plan, and have a happy, happy Thanksgiving.